I was there last week, in some really bad burnt areas, there's still tracks, deer tracks. So whether they got away from the fire or they've moved in since, which is either either, um, and they just threaten all those new shoots coming up. The type of deer that we're going to find out here in this part of Victoria is uh, samba, fallow and red deer. Um, down the coast, hog deer as well. Uh, my name's Brad. I've been a conservationist basically since I was three years old. Um, in a professional capacity, I've probably since 2006 um, worked for Depor in the Kimberley and now I have my own business, Procon Pest and Wildlife Management. I do fauna surveys and pest control. See, that's, that's only well, an inch and a little bit long, so it's either going to be a small spiker or a, more likely a young doe. Yeah. Yeah. Front foot, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. And the back foot. Yeah, so just from like the stride, the distance on the side. So yeah, it's a real slow walk. <laughs> yeah. 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 During, during that rut time in April around Easter weekend, they start to do stuff like this. Yeah. They'll dig in the ground and they'll urinate in that, and that's sort of a marker post. Yeah. And you might follow the fence line, they'll go down way in the bush and do another one. Every morning he'll come back and he'll refresh these, he'll pee in each of them. Yeah, okay. So that's what a lot of the hunters have clued, on, clued onto that, and he'll sit. Down there, that deer will walk around here for a minute or two. He's got all the time in the world to make that shot. Yeah. Deer are introduced to Australia. So are European people, I suppose. So my heritage is European. The ironic thing is, I suppose, European people have been interacting with deer for uh, hundreds of thousands of years. But when we come to this new land, we have made an impact, but also these deer that we brought along with us are still emerging as, as an issue because those small populations which were introduced for hunting are now continuing to spread. Where they're from in India, the pressure from tigers and the hunting pressure from tigers, they're just freaks at hiding um, and being elusive, even in, when their population is abundant, um, they can remain unseen. Um, especially samba that they can breed all year round. Um, hunting pressure knocks them back a little bit, but not enough. And they don't have predators, they don't have natural predators in Australia, so um, any population of a herbivore often has a, a predator-prey relationship, and if you drop that herbivore with its breeding um, cycles and, and natural fecundity into a landscape without those predators, you basically take the lid off their population and, and you know, 100 years or 200 years later, we're still seeing this ripple effect of those introductions of deer species. And it takes a long time, but they, they spread and they're spreading all through Victoria and, and up the East Coast in particular. And it's an emerging issue that those populations um, without predators are having an impact on the vegetation. Deer tend to get into the gullies and trample stuff, eat stuff. Um, and these gullies are quite sensitive to, to trampling with um, yeah, big deer hooves rather than um, small animals getting through or um, you know, wallabies and kangaroos and that sort of thing passing through. It's just snap tree after snap tree, just a line, maybe sort of three, four hundred metres at some of these properties and it's just the whole way down. They directly threaten 60 different um, species of plant. And that's just samba. From a distance it's fine, but once you get in there, it, it might only have 10 key species, whereas it may originally or normally have 30 species, and it's just because... So it becomes a poorer bit of forest, and then there's also the other associations of species that rely on those ones that have been taken out. So there might be a, you know, like a potteroo or, or something that relies on a particular plant or a particular type of fungi. That's how ecology works. If the deer take that plant out, well then that ripples through to some of the other species. So you end up with, the, the fancy word's depauperate, but it means poor. You end up with poor bush. And it might just be gum trees and bergen and dogwood. And it would, would it affect aquatic life too, with hugging of waterways? Yeah, big time, yeah. And the other thing is, all, all the years I've been working down here, not well, four years only, I've seen two long-nosed bandicoot. 
So that's the other thing, is the deer destroy the understory and then the foxes and the cats can hunt more efficiently because they've got a clear understory. And that's the biggest thing for me. The two I've seen were both near blackberry bushes, like big areas of blackberry. So you kind of like the, bla the blackberry is probably handy for a lot of those smaller terrestrial species. And yeah, as soon as the deer are there, there's just no understory left, so. You obviously want to think about how high the animal is off the ground. No point putting it up there. And you don't want to put it down too low either because it gets mucked around by um, wallabies and wombats are really bad as well if you put it down too low. So for deer, it's perfect. And you can see that trail that they're coming down through here, straight where your feet are. So anywhere there, it's perfect. These are barley. Oh, cool. I don't know if they So this project involves people getting out there, setting cameras up, so the cameras are game cameras, so they'll, they'll be triggered by any movement, so you might get, um, you know, a hundred movements in the day of birds and the odd leaf, but if you look at the sign and you set it up an area that's got deer sign, then you'll see the deer movements, you'll see the diurnal, nocturnal behaviour, basically what time of day, what time of night the deer come through there. And that's important to understand management because deer will often live in one area and then feed in another. So game cameras can show you when they're moving through and that might be something that, um, particularly if you're getting control done, that the, the control um, people can learn th from that behaviour. Yeah, a little welcome sign there, countdown when I turn it on. So game cameras are an important uh, monitoring tool um, to measure habits and times that deer are coming out and what, where they're impacting, um, especially trying to figure out a pattern and then that can allow us to um, control a lot easier. Um, they don't always have a pattern, but a lot of the time they can. Um, the benefit to culling is basically just protecting the, the, the plant species that they threaten. Um, broad scale control is difficult, um, it just comes down to funding really, but really to control an area we need a broad scale approach, um, not just sort of hitting a thousand hectare area, it needs to be a large area. Um, it's not really happening at the moment as much as it should. Uh, the high country they are doing a little bit, but um, yeah, there's still a lot of deer around. So to, to control a population you really need to sort of knock back about 70% of the population. If you hit about 50% of the population down it's just breaking even, um, it's not going to have much of an impact. So yeah 70% that's with most species as well, pigs as well. Data suggests that the growth of deer in Victoria alone is 300,000 a year. Um, I would imagine that's going to get to a point where they are sort of overabundant and Maybe they won't be able to breed as much, I'm really not too sure, but the population is growing rapidly at the moment, expanding into areas where they weren't found before. And it's just going to be getting worse and worse, really. I mean, you could possibly trap deer when a fellow deer there's a big herd of them. Mm. Um, I've, I've thought about things like nets, drop nets and things. Yeah. Because they're not scared of anything, that walking under anything. Yeah, okay. You wouldn't get them walking through a tight gate like you could with a pig or a goat or something okay. like that. But you know, I have thought about designs where you've got a big drop net that falls so over a herd. Yeah. But you'd want to get a lot of them at one point. But, you know, it's so labour intensive, so like something like that. You'd want to get a fair few of them at once. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you have to do it. Well. And then you've got to shoot them. But I don't think even that would get through ethics to be able to drop a net over deer and uh, just the stress caused by that, holding them tight and then shooting them all mm. one by yeah. one, one next to each other trapped. It's, because if you had a herd and you started shooting them, that's got to yeah, be Yeah, if you have a couple of shooters, you can usually get a few of them, especially if it's fallow. Mm -hmm. um, you can usually get sort of eight or something like that out of a mob, depending on the terrain, of course. In here, it'd be hard to get more than three or four. In a night? <laughs> well, no, just in one mob. Yeah, so if they're okay. walking down one of these trails and you're sitting up here, they, they scatter pretty quick. Um, but that's, yep. you just do it more strategically. So you'd have shooters here and then you'd have shooters on the trail down there. Okay. Um, what does that guy say? It's like dropping a bag of marbles sometimes. Yeah. When, you, when you shoot yeah. one, they just... Go wild, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You said with your um your samba in the wallows, they'll, they'll just keep digging those wallows out. The, the hinds will wallow. Um, the fawns will wallow and the stags, stags do the worst, generally just 
fill it up with urine and cover themselves in it. Yep. Pretty nasty animals. <laughs> Hence the smell when you get close to them. Yeah. And you probably will smell them before yep. you see them a lot. Um, if he sees you first, you, he'll, uh, hinds and stags will generally honk. They'll do a warning call. Um, and if you've heard it before, you've jumped out of your skin before. It's like standing in front of a truck and you don't know old mate's yeah. gonna pull the horn. <laughs> Events like this and projects like this are great because you get this exchange between some of the older people with practical knowledge and some of the people with young, uh, younger people with environment knowledge. Um, that's kind of the essence of land care in many ways. It's often about getting people together and doing work, but it's the exchange of knowledge and ideas. It's almost the real learning by doing and getting out there in the rain and you know going for a walk and looking at what a deer print looks like. What does a, a deer rub on a, a rainforest plant look like? What does the damage that deers do to a waterway look like? Some people, particularly like an old deer hunter, might see that and you know they've seen it a hundred times. But to a young person lear learning, it's you can't learn it from a book. You've got to get out there and, and learn it in the field.